Hey guys, how are you doing today? I'm not doing so good. I'm not feeling so good. <clears throat> it's been a rough day. I I wasn't feeling good and I went to the nurse and she gave me this note to show my mommy. <laughs> well, I'm just being silly. But if you saw somebody with tissue and sounded like they were all stuffed up, they had a temperature of 100%. 100%. 0.7. What could you infer about that person? What's that word that I said? It's infer. Let me shrink myself a little bit here. Infer, make an inference. You could make an inference. You could infer that that person's sick, right? You could infer they're not feeling well at all. If they're got tissues and stuffy and have a fever. That person's sick. You could make that inference. And that's one of the skills we're going to look at uh, this week making inferences. Uh, what do you think is happening based on clues that you give, that you are given rather. Authors may not tell you everything in a text. Sometimes you have to make inferences to fill in the holes. Use clues from the text. Now I didn't have, I'm not a text, but I had a, I had a tissue and I had a temperature. So those are clues. You use those clues plus what you know to make inferences. You know that Somebody's temperature shouldn't be 100.7, should it? And uh, if somebody was talking like I was talking at the beginning, they probably are not feeling very well. So when we're reading a book, we use clues from the text plus what we already know, text evidence plus background knowledge to give us an understanding. You came to the understanding, oh, Mr. Helton must be sick today. Thank goodness I'm not. I don't want to be sick. Um, but you could have made that inference the way I was acting, couldn't you? So we're going to talk some more about making inferences this week. And, and uh, when we read the text today, we may read some, make some inferences as we're reading along. And so we are starting a new text today. And anytime we start a new text, we've got to look at the vocabulary that we'll be reading to make sure we have these words in our belt. So when we're reading, we know what we are reading, what these words are. You are doing a great job reading. I enjoyed listening to you read last week for our uh, Ames Web uh, testing. All right, so we've got six words this week that we're going to be working with. This is one of those weeks where we just have one story and not two. And so as we look at these six words, these are the ones we'll be looking at all week long. And so the first word is shatter. You've probably heard that word before, shatter. If something breaks, it shatters, okay? When things shatter, they explode or suddenly break into pieces. A glass vase will shatter if it's dropped. Yeah, so shatter, something is breaking. Here's a word you probably have not heard before. Sentries, unless it's on one of your video games, because sentries are guards or lookouts who stand in a place to keep watch. They're kind of like guards. Have you seen the, um, like the castle in England where the queen lives and you have those soldiers outside standing very still in their red outfit with their big black hats on? Those are sentries. They're guards who are keeping watch over the palace where the queen lives in England. The sentries stood outside the castle gates. The next word is, this is a funny word. It looks like it should be chasm, but that. H is actually silent, or it makes the CH, I guess, make the K sound, so it's a chasm. A chasm is a deep crack or opening in the ground. Hikers must be careful not to fall into a chasm. Okay, so remember this word is chasm, chasm. Glistens, if something glistens, it sparkles or shines. Some of you like to glisten, you put a little glitter on your face, girls, and you like to glisten and look all sparkly like a princess, right? If something glistens, it sparkles or shines. Newly fallen snow glistens in the sunlight. The next word is embedded. I like to be embedded. <laughs> Embed. I'm just being silly. Okay, Mr. Helton's getting silly today. Embedded. If a thing is embedded, it's firmly set into something else that surrounds it. I guess the best example that you probably um, would be able to look at is your mom's wedding ring or somebody in your family's wedding ring. If they have a diamond that's embedded in the in the gold ring, here's my wedding ring that, ring that my wife gave me. But men's rings usually don't have things embedded into them. Uh, but the w women's wedding ring might have a diamond embedded on it. So it's firmly set into something else that surrounds it. 
embedded. Eroding. If something is eroding, we know this from science, don't we? This is not new to us. It's slowly wearing away, often from wind or water. Eroding. Think of the word we learned from science, erosion. This is a form of that word. Something is eroding. It's wearing away, often from wind or water. Okay. Storms often cause eroding around coastlines. Okay. So shatter centuries, chasm, glistens, embedded, and eroding. All right. So we'll look for these words in our story today. Our story this week is in your my book. Uh, I'll tell you what page in just a second. Let me go tell you what page right now so you can turn there with me as I'm talking. I can't see. Go down, go down. Well, one more page and I'll tell you. This is giving me trouble today. We're on page 58 in your My Book 2. Drake, I hope you come get your My Book 2 sometime so you can read along with us. It's still in the office the last time I was up there. So this week, our story is literary nonfiction. I don't remember reading a story that's literary nonfiction before, do you? It tells us a factually accurate story using literary techniques. Hmm. So it's, a, it's, it's something that's true in story form, in other words. Literary nonfiction presents events in sequential. That means the order they happened. Uh, chronological means the same thing. Sequential or chronological order. Science text includes words that are specific to the topic. Authors of literary nonfiction may use figurative language. You know that. We're going to look at that again later in the week such as similes and metaphors to describe real places or events. All right, we'll turn over to page 58 in your book, and let's read Grand Canyon together. Grand Canyon, A Trail Through Time by Linda Vieira, illustrations by Christopher Canyon. Dawn comes bringing daylight to spires and buttes standing like sentries. On, on the plateau, worn down by weathering and erosion. Coyotes teach their pups to hunt for food in thick forests along the edges of the canyon. Thousands of visitors from all over the world have come to view the splendor of the Grand Canyon. In campgrounds and lodges near the north and south rims, they prepare for the day's activities. Oh, my goodness, I skipped a whole page. I'm sorry. You all knew that, but I didn't. A pre-dawn storm rumbles over Grand Canyon National Park. Cracks of lightning shatter the dark sky, flashing above an enormous plateau. Peak of peaks, valleys, and trenches where ancient mountains once stood. The deepest trench is called the Grand Canyon, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. So, look at that lightning there. Look at the illustrations. The illustrator of this is phenomenal. I mean, it looks so real, doesn't it? That lightning from the sky and the nighttime, the Grand Canyon, like the pink and purple colors in the sky. It's a beautiful picture. And over this page, we've got some people looking in it. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? I have not. That is one of my goals to go out west. The farthest west I've ever been is Kansas City, Missouri. But I'd like to go farther west out and see the Grand Canyon, maybe Yellowstone. Let's keep reading about the Grand Canyon. This morning, I'm sorry, the morning sun climbs above distant mountains, revealing cliffs hanging over the Colorado River at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The river took almost six million years to carve the canyon, creating a channel about one mile deep and more than 275 miles long. Wind and water wore down its steep sides, widening the chasm between the cliffs. A raven glides across the opening, making lazy circles over the river far below. The sun chases away shadows on the craggy rocks thousands of feet below the rims. Pack mules begin a five-hour trip down to the deepest part of the canyon. How long does it take to get to the bottom of the canyon on a mule? Five hours. They follow each other along a twisted 10-mile trail, 10 mile to the riverbed. Clouds of dust follow them as voices from the top fade away. I don't know about you, but I'm not getting on a mule that's that close to falling off the edge of a, the Grand Canyon. I'm scared of heights, so that's not what I'm going to do when I go to the Grand Canyon. I think I'll just stand back from the edge a little bit and look at it. 
But these people seem to be enjoying it. Look at this animal here. Canyon visitors along the trail peer with curiosity at symbols of people and animals that were painted on a boulder by Havasuapi Indians long ago. Havasupai, I don't, I don't know how to say that. We'll just say Havasupai still live on the canyon today, tending their flock and farms in the summertime, hunting small game and gathering nuts and berries in the winter months. When is this? This is now. Havasupai still live in the canyon today, tending their flock and farms in the summertime, hunting small game and gathering nuts and berries in the winter months. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that, did you? As the sun moves higher in the sky, smaller side canyons with rocks layered like multicolored ribbons come into view. Oh, look at this. Here's a simile, isn't it? Rocks like multicolored ribbons. Yeah, comparing rocks, to uh, colors of these rocks to ribbons. Bighorn sheep walk easily along the steep walls of the canyon, looking for food in hidden pockets of soil. Wildflowers stand around them in per patches of purple and pink. Look here. Patches of purple and pink. That's a little bit of alliteration, isn't it? P, P, P. There's that bighorn sheep. Don't want to miss this page. The mules continue down the trail to the inner gorge. They carry their riders past layers of rock that display millions of years of the Earth's geological history. A canyon wren looks for bits of brush to line its nest, hidden in a rocky crevice just off the trail. It searches for twigs and grasses up and down the canyon walls, flying past fossils of fish teeth and seashells. What? Fish teeth and seashells in the Grand Canyon? What in the world? Maybe we'll find out. The noonday sun glistens on a hidden creek near a granary built into the canyon wall by the Anasazi Indians almost a thousand years ago. Squirrels chased through the now empty granary where crops and plants had been stored for food and trade. A lizard scurries off the trail. It climbs over fossils of prehistoric trilobites embedded in layers of shell millions of years ago when the land was covered by a primeval sea. So this land used to be covered by sea, they believe. After the mules pass, the lizard creeps out from its hiding place to soak up the warmth of the sun. My cat did that yesterday. It was a sunny day. She was out laying in the sun like this lizard. The afternoon sun hangs low in the sky. A white-breasted nuthatch flies above beaver tail cacti along the rocky bands of the Colorado River. Its song drifts over ancient pink white, and gray rocks at the river's edge, the roots of mountains that stood there almost two billion years ago. The water tumbles over cascading rapids while trout search for quieter streams in which to spawn. A ringtail cat drinks from a slower side stream, watching for predators up and down the red rocks and along the river nearby. Laughter echoes from a bunkhouse as weary riders and hikers share stories of their descent into the canyon. The endless cycle of eroding rock and moving water carved the Grand Canyon millions of years ago. Blustering wind and pounding rain continue to widen it, grinding down rocks that used to be mountains and volcanoes. The rushing Colorado River deepens this natural wonder, dragging rocks and mud along its path through ancient plains and lava flows. Beautiful illustrations. The mules rest for the night in a corral near the river, awaiting tomorrow's seven hour trip back up the top. It took five to get down. It's going to take seven to get back up. Weather and erosion make tiny changes every day in the rocky walls along the trail. Millions of years into the future, the same forces of nature will continue to reshape the Grand Canyon, digging even deeper into the history of our planet. And that's it. What do you think about that story? It's not really so much of a, a flowing story, was it? It was kind of a little look at different pieces of the Grand Canyon a little bit at a time. We're going to come back and talk about some of these questions on Wednesday when we read it again together. But we've got quite a bit to do today, so we're going to move on now to our decoding. And as we work with words this week, what we're going to see is 
Let me shrink this down a little bit so we can get it all on this page. There we go. All we're going to see is that we're using prefixes this weekend, our wor the words we're working with, and our spelling as well. So the three prefixes we're going to focus on this week are re, un, and dis. Remember, prefixes are at the beginning of words. Pre means before. So prefixes are part, little word parts that come before a root word. That's what this says, I bet. A prefix is a word part that appears before a root word and changes the root word's meaning. Re, un, and dis are common prefixes. Let's think about what these mean. What does re mean? You retell, you tell it again. If you repeat, you say it again, right? If you reread, you read it again. So re means to do it again. Un, that means it's not, right? Unsafe means not safe. Untidy means it's not tidy, not clean. So un means not. Dis, what does dis mean? Dislike means you don't like something. Distaste. You don't like the, that taste. Uh, disagree means you don't agree. So this kind of means don't or to not do something, right? So here's these words. They're not as kind of they're not as hard. But what I want us to do is find the root word and the prefix on each one of them. The prefix is so easy to find; it's the beginning of the word. But let's find the root word, okay? So this one is tell with the prefix re retell. Root word safe with a prefix un before it. Root word like with the prefix dis before it. Root word paid with the prefix re before it. And root word tidy with a prefix un before it. All right. So pre here's the root word taste, distaste, true, untrue, count, recount, Paint, repaint, lock, unlock, read, reread, sell, resell, fold, unfold, agree, disagree, happy, unhappy, known, unknown, admit, readmit, charge, discharge, dial, Redial, clasp, unclasp, belief, disbelief, grow, regrow, tie, untie, fill, refill, like, and dislike. So you see every one of these words have one of those prefixes, um, re, un, or dis in front of the root word. Let's find the words in these sentences that have the prefixes on them. Some people think it is Unimportant means it's not important. To recycle cans and bottles. So unimportant and recycle are root words that have the un and re in front of them. Matthias had to unbutton, there's one, his shirt before taking it off. All right. So. There's our uh, phonics, our decoding skills we'll need for this week. Those prefixes on the front of root words. Our spelling list looked just like that. Here are our spelling words for this week. Let me scroll down just a little bit here. All right, so our spelling words are unused. And again, before I go through these, you might want to pause the video right now. Write these down on a sheet of notebook paper so you can study them with mom and dad this week. Unused, refresh, disobey, replace, unpaid, redo, <clears throat> disorder, unplanned. Notice unplanned has the two ends in it. Remove, untrue, unload, recall. There's the two L's there, double L. Displease, uneven, rebuild, restart, uncover. Untidy, discolor, distrusted, undaunted, dishonest, disagree, and resurface. So this is your words you'll be working with all week long. Jot them down. Make sure you've got them spelled correctly. 
pause the video if you need to. Okay. All right. I want to look at one more thing this week as we look at grammar. Uh, we're going to be talking about prepositions. So I'm going to let this lesson right here on the next slide. You'll see this on the next slide. If you will watch this lesson on prepositions, it's about three, four minutes long just to review. And then also, once you have kind of a general knowledge in your head of what prepositions are, I put this schoolhouse rock that teaches you lots of prepositions uh, this, through a song. And then you'll have a preposition assignment today to go and uh, find some prepositions in the sentences. OK, and so your assignments today, you're going to, number one, uh, review our vocabulary words um, from that we learned today. Um, this will be some matching, matching the words to their to their meaning. So that'll be the first thing you need to do. And then also, after you've watched these preposition videos, you're going to have a little prep, easy preposition assignment. OK, so those are the two things you need to complete for me today. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.